Hello and welcome to this channel. My name is Victoria and in this video we will talk about juvenile idiopathic arthritis and reactive arthritis. In the first part of the video we will talk about juvenile idiopathic arthritis, in the second part about reactive arthritis. So the juvenile idiopathic arthritis is a chronic arthritis in children usually before the age of 16 which affects one or more joints and is subdivided into different types and categories. The different types are oligoarthritis, rheumatoid factor negative polyarthritis, antithesis related arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, systemic arthritis called Stills disease and rheumatoid factor positive polyarthritis. Juvenile idiopathic arthritis affects around 4 to 5 out of 100,000 children. The exact cause is unknown, but it is thought that there is an autoimmune mechanism involved, together with a genetic predisposition, which can favor the outbreak of the disease. Some of the genetic factors include the susceptibility gene CD25, which codes for the interleukin-2 receptor alpha. Another possible cause is infections in childhood age, with for example parvovirus B19 or the rubella virus. In juvenile idiopathic arthritis, there's usually a chronic inflammation of the synovium together with the destruction of the cartilage. It is also possible that connective tissue and other organs are affected. The disease usually presents with exacerbations so sudden temporary worsening of the symptoms. The onset is usually before the age of 5, but it can occur during the whole childhood and into adult life. In the children that present with symptoms before the age of 5, boys and girls are equally affected, but over the age of 5, it occurs more often in girls. Some of the clinical features include high remittent fever, joint pain, a salmon pink or red rash, lymphadenopathy, hepatosplenomegaly, sericitis, pericarditis, anemia, hepatitis and myalgia, so muscle pain. Some of the laboratory values that we can see is a high erythrocyte sedimentation rate, low hemoglobin, high leukocytes and platelets, as well as often negative findings of anti-nuclear antibodies and negative IgM rheumatoid factors. However, both of those can be positive as well. The differential diagnoses include infections, malignant diseases, systemic lupus erythematosus, vasculitis and many more. What is the course and prognosis of the disease? There are four possible outcomes. First, around 50% of patients will have recurrent episodes of the systemic disease. Second, some will experience a progressive arthritis irrespective of whether there are exacerbations. So some will get worse and worse and worse linearly, while others worsen with every exacerbation in a more step-like manner. Third, in some children that have a progressive disease, this leads to poor growth and amyloidosis. Fourth, rarely the MAS syndrome develops, which is a life-threatening complication. So how do we treat those patients? There are several pharmacological and conservative approaches. We can, for example, put a splint around joints to prevent their deformity and advise the patient to do physiotherapy to maintain joint mobility and muscle function. Usually patients experience pain, inflammation and fever, all of which we can treat with NSAIDs. Also the anti-inflammatory corticosteroids are used, either orally, as a pulse therapy or intra-articularly, so per injection into the joint. We can also use immunosuppressants as methotrexate and cyclosporin or biologics. Some of the biologics that are used are interleukin-1 inhibitors as anakinra, interleukin-6 inhibitors as toclizumab, 
and T-cell activation inhibitors as abatacept. Now we talked about some general features that are the same for all subgroups of juvenile idiopathic arthritis. Let's now have a closer look at the different forms. The first form I want to talk about is persistent or extended oligoarthritis. This generally occurs under the age of 6 and is more common in girls. It usually involves four or fewer joints, most commonly the knee, ankle, elbow or a single finger joint. The patient usually shows with early local growth anomalies and there is the risk to develop chronic iridocyclitis in the first five years of the disease. This occurs in around 30% of patients and it is the inflammation of the iris and ciliary body in the eye. It can lead to the eye becoming painful, red and sensitive to sunlight. To diagnose this form we can do some blood tests. Usually the erythrocyte sedimentation rate is elevated but initially it may be normal. Also the hemoglobin, white blood cells and platelet levels are usually normal. The antinuclear antibodies, short ANA, are often positive. Over the time of the disease, the patient usually experiences exacerbations and remissions and the affected limb will not be able to grow in the same way as the unaffected limb. Also often within the first half year of the disease, more joints become involved. The next form I want to talk about is the enthesis related juvenile idiopathic arthritis. This is usually the concomitant occurrence of arthritis together with enthesitis. Or arthritis or enthesitis together with at least two of the following which are uveitis, HLA B27 positivity or sacroiliitis. Enthesitis is when the site of attachment of a tendon, ligament, fascia or capsule of a bone become inflamed. It often occurs a little later in childhood, at around 9 to 12 years of age, and occurs usually asymmetrically. Two-thirds of patients will not lose the functionality of the affected joint, however more joints can become affected over time. In some patients, the hips, neck, spine and mandible can become affected, which can cause serious problems. The next form is the IgM rheumatoid factor positive polyarthritis. It is the arthritis that occurs in five or more joints during the first six months in which the patient experiences symptoms. It also occurs at around 9 to 12 years of age and is more common in females. It usually has an aggressive progression and is usually symmetrical, especially in the smaller joints as in the fingers, wrists, ankles, feet, knees and the hip. There are also often rheumatoid nodules palpable. Important to note for this type is that the IgM rheumatoid factor is persistently positive and in an X-ray we can see erosive changes early in the disease. Unfortunately, the disease is quite aggressive in the joint destruction, which usually, usually leads to loss of functionality and brings the long-term risk of atlantoaxial sublocation, aortic incompetence and amyloidosis. The next form is the IgM rheumatoid factor negative polyarthritis. It occurs at any pediatric age, but usually before the first birthday and occurs more commonly in girls. It also affects five or more joints at the onset of the disease and can be either symmetric or asymmetric. It can affect small as well as large joints, most commonly the knees, wrists, ankles and the distal interphalangeal joints of the hand while the metacarpophalangeal joints are often spared. Some patients may also experience low-grade fever, a mild lymphadenopathy and sometimes an inflammation in the tendons at flexor site. The course of this disease is variable. It may occur without exacerbations 
or with recurrent episodes of worsening of the symptoms that usually leads to deformity of the joints. The next form is the juvenile psoriatic arthritis. It is an arthritis that occurs together with psoriasis or arthritis that occurs with two of the following factors that are dactylitis, nail pitting, or when a first degree relative has psoriasis. It occurs usually asymmetrically, mainly in the small and intermediate sized joints. In around half of the cases, one of the knees is affected, in around 40% the fingers are affected, and in around 25% the toes are affected. Before we start to talk about reactive arthritis, I would like to talk about some imaging techniques that we can use to diagnose a patient. In an MRI, we can see signs even before they become apparent in an X-ray. We can sometimes see joint effusions and tendosynovitis, bone marrow edema, erosions and a thickened synovia. For the MRI, it is important to use contrast media. In an X-ray, we can check for some early signs of the disease. Those include periostitis, which is initially seen in young children, and a difference in growth of the epiphysis compared to the contralateral side. Also a uniform osteopenia, joint effusions, progressive destruction of the cartilage, and disordered growth can be observed. So now let's talk about reactive arthritis. This is a form of non-septic arthritis, which develops after an infection that was localized somewhere else in the body. Some of the bacteria that can cause a reactive arthritis are Salmonella, Shigella, Yersinia, and Campylobacter, which all cause infections of the gastrointestinal tract, and Chlamydia and Ureoplasma bacteria, which cause infections of the genitourinary tract. The clinical manifestation occurs in three stages. The first stage is the stage of the actual infection. This is usually one week to one month before the patient develops symptoms of the reactive arthritis. The second stage is the longest stage and can last weeks to months. This is the active period of the reactive arthritis. The third and last stage is the remission and recurrence stage, which occurs in patients that are pa positive for AGLA B27. The patient experiences times with worse symptoms and times where the symptoms become less severe. Besides the arthritis that is usually seen, patients may also experience continuous fever, weight loss, fatigue and weakness in their muscles. At the onset of the disease, around two-thirds of children develop a conjunctivitis. In the laboratory tests, we can see a mild decrease in hemoglobin together with leukocytosis, neutrophilia and raised inflammatory markers. Outer antibodies are usually negative, but HLB27 is usually positive. The synovial fluid does not show any bacteria but at the initial infection, so stage 1 of the clinical manifestation, the blood, urine or stool culture will show a bacteria that caused the reactive arthritis. Usually the treatment consists of NSAIDs and sometimes corticosteroids may be used as well. This is usually for the more severe cases. After stage 1, when the arthritis developed, there is no evidence that antibiotics would help as the inflammation of the joint is not showing any bacteria. That's it for this video, I hope it was helpful and if you like our channel please comment, like and subscribe. Thank you very much.